message to you. There will be an inspiration to you to do even better for the kingdom of God now and in the future. There may be some things you know before. There may be some things that you need to brush up on. And there may be some new things that you will learn as we go on. So may God richly bless you as we begin. And at this time, I'm going to turn over to Reverend Dr. Martel Farley. He's our district superintendent in the Barbados district and ask him to open us with his welcome remarks and a word of prayer. Reverend Farley. Good evening to all. Can you hear me, can you? Oh, okay. Yes, sir. All right, good evening. We trust that you've had a good day and uh, we want to surely welcome everyone to this special training. Um, let me in particular, welcome all the participants. We are glad that you have seen it necessary to be part of this event and you've made time, the science school teachers and other members and school workers have made time to be part of this training. I'm sure it will all go well for the development of the Sunday school and the church at large. And in particular, we also want to welcome all the pastors who are here and those who will join us. Well, I believe that especially we are very happy to have Reverend Montessier with us, and we are glad, sir, that you have consented to assist us in conducting this session. Greetings from the Barbados District to you and the members of your family. Thank you so much for your sacrifice. And of course, we also want to thank Sister Jennifer, um, usual presenter for joining us again. Um, we look forward to a wonderful time this evening. Let us pray. Let us pray. Father, we recognize the importance of preparing ourselves for ministry. We consider it necessary, not just that we become disciples, but that we, in turn, disciple others. We understand the significance of that. And even as we meet for these training sessions, help us, O oh Lord, to recognize the importance of these sessions in equipping ourselves for ministry so that we can become effective disciples and disciples. So I pray this evening for the presenters, Reverend Montessier and Sister Jennifer, and even, of course, also we pray for our science school director, even as they would lead in this evening's session, and of course, the other two to come. That we will strengthen them, give them insight and wisdom. I pray for a special anointing upon them, even as they present. It will not necessarily just be presenting, but Lord, that your, your favor, your anointing will rest upon them and that this session will be life-changing for all of us. So we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We are not in a physical environment here on this virtual platform, but I know that your Holy Spirit surely can still be very much present among us. And so, Father, I pray that I pray, God, that you will excite the hearts of all participants and may this be a session of growth. We thank you, Lord. For Christ's sake, amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Farley, for your wonderful wishes. At this time, I'm going to introduce to you our trainers. First, we have Reverend Monty Sear. He is our global missionary for the Church of the Nazarene on the Mesoamerican region serving as the regional coordinator for the discipleship ministry since 2011. Now his main responsibilities include training leaders and pastors and working with districts and local churches to develop relevant and effective discipleship strategies 
to make Christ-like disciples in the nation. Monty graduated from Northwest Nazarene University with a religion degree in 1986. He received his Master of Divinity from Nazarene Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri in 1990. And he served as a full-time youth pastor from 1990 until his missionary appointment in 1998. Monty has also served as the African Region Youth Ministries Coordinator from 98 until 2006, Global NYA President from 2005 to 2009, and the Caribbean Region Youth Ministries Coordinator from 2006 until 2011. Monty and his wife, Bethany, live in Guatemala City after moving there in August of 2012. They have four children and two grandchildren living in the USA. And I'm sure he will show you his wonderful photograph of his family. Our next trainer, joined the Samaritan Spurs as a volunteer in 2016, received certification as a trainer of trainers in 2017. She has been serving on the local board of Samaritan Spurs, Operation Christmas Child, as we know it from 2017, and assisting in the training of teachers across Barbados for the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program. We know her as Sister Jennifer Graves, and she is more known to us in terms of being our SDMI District Secretary 24, 2024, 2004 to 2009. I'm, uh, I'm running ahead with the dates here, Jennifer. And as our SDMI District Chair from 2010 to 2020, she is the, hus the wife of one husband. She has two adult sons and two teenage grandchildren. Our trainers this evening, Reverend Montessier and Sister Jennifer, Jennifer Graves. So Reverend Monty, I will turn over to you for your opening remarks and, and I will let you progress with the training from this point. All right. Reverend. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It is so good to be with all of you tonight. Um, even though I'm in Guatemala and you're in Barbados, and let me tell you, I'd sure rather be there with you and then teaching you from long distance. It was funny, today I was uh, scrolling through some uh, Facebook messages, and you know, sometimes on Facebook you'll get a little, you'll get a message saying that uh, you have a, a memory from this time last year or five years ago, and the memory that popped up was from, I believe, six years ago. And I was in Barbados uh, six years ago on this day doing a training. And I thought, wow, I, I, I need to have that. I need to be there now. But uh, this is better than nothing. Um, you know, I'm hopefully that, you know, this will come to an end, this all this COVID stuff, and we'll be able to be back together uh, in the same place when we're doing this training. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, for these next couple of uh, evenings. And uh, I know that you have a lot of things to do uh, other than this, but you've chosen this. And I know that God's going to uh, bless that commitment that you have to grow as uh, his leader, as uh, his worker in the kingdom. And so thank you again for being here uh, tonight. Now, uh, we have been doing leadership training in, uh, on this district for quite some time. And I'm just so grateful for your commitment to learn and grow. And uh, as Sister Myrell mentioned, um, this is number six. It's hard to believe we've gone through six different courses, six different books, and this is number six. And so some of you have been along the whole way. You've gone all through the first five, and here's number six. Others of you, maybe you've only caught a couple of them, or maybe this is your very first time. And so wherever, wherever you come into that spectrum, we're so glad that you are um, that you've joined us. And so just a couple of things to begin with. Um, you should have all have received a, a notebook. I know that it's digital, a PDF, uh, but that will have your notes in that. And uh, hopefully you'll, uh, some of you, it's best if, you know, maybe you printed it all out so you can write in there. Others of you, maybe you're going to do that on your computer. Uh, but I just, I want to encourage you to take notes, whatever format that looks like. Take notes so that you can remember what we're talking about so you can remember for yourself as you're growing and learning, um, but also use it to help others as you train and teach and pass on the training. 
Um, I hope that each one of you are here to, for these workshops to grow personally as a leader, but also to grow in such a way that you can pass it on to somebody else. And so uh, here's, a, here's my notebook and you can see I'm, I'm doing all kinds of, whoa, that's kind of, there we go. You can see all different kinds of uh, writing and, and outlines and coloring, uh, highlighting, just so that it helps me remember what I am, um, what helps me remember what I'm learning, but also will help me when I pass it on to other people. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and start with lesson number one, and I'm going to share my screen with you. And are you able to see my whole screen? Am I getting some yeses? Yes. All right, good. Well, look at this beautiful family on here. Uh, those of you who I who have been coming to these for a while, you've seen this picture change from little little guys to now they're big guys. Um, but I have, as was mentioned, my wife and I, my wife Bethany and I, we live here in Guatemala City and and have a have the joy of serving from this beautiful place. But we have four adult children. Uh, who have grown up and have left home and now are living in the United States. Uh, our, our oldest, but well, first my wife, Bethany, you see there beside me, what an amazing uh, life partner. We've been married for 36 years. It's hard to, make, hard to believe that, that, that she can look that good being married to me for that long. Uh, uh, other guys out there, you're, you have hope as well. Um, but anyway, uh, wonderful partner in life and ministry. And then our four kids, Robert with the green hat, he's 30. Uh, he lives and works in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Our daughter, Amy, our oldest daughter, Amy, right beside me with the long blonde hair. She lives in Alaska. In fact, right now she's doing a special. She's working for BBC, uh, helping to, uh, to record programs up in Alaska right now. They're in Eagle, Alaska. And uh, last week it was minus 45 degrees, 45 degrees below zero. That is really, really cold. But anyway, she's in Alaska working there. And then our younger son, Brian, right in the middle, the tall young man holding the little girl. Uh, he's uh, 26, and he is a, a public school teacher, a music teacher, band teacher in Louisville, Kentucky. His wife, Jackie, is right in front of him, and they are both holding their two children, our grandchildren. And then our daughter, Kaylee, our youngest daughter, um, in, the, in the front there. Uh, she is 21 and lives in, and she's a student in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, as a, a student at Trevecca Nazarene University. Uh, so that's this is this is our last picture that we have all of us together. That was taken about a year ago, and so this picture is taken more recent, uh, just a couple months ago, with our grandchildren. Uh, uh, Miles, I'm I'm holding Miles, and he's one year old, and uh, Clara is three, and so we're just so grateful for these little munchkins. We're so. We're, it's, isn't it great to be a grandparent, for those of you who are grandparents? Well, let's move on here. Thanks for indulging me and letting me introduce my family to you. They send their greetings to you. Uh, and they are, uh, I am who I am a lot because of my family. Uh, you'd realize that. Well, let's look at the, the first lesson of this Million Leader Mandate, notebook number six. Today matters, leadership and personal growth. And if, that should be in about page number three of your notebook. Um, I don't know about you. I mean, you are, you live on an island. You're surrounded by the ocean. Beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, I love com coming to Barbados. I love the ocean. Um, when I come to the ocean, one of the things I love doing in the ocean is I love to scuba dive. Here you can see a picture of me scuba diving. Um, but I love being under the water. And the, the beautiful, the fish, the corals you can see. Um, incredible. Uh, most you know, and even some of the big ones that you see are pretty incredible. Um, maybe you might catch your breath a little bit when you see some of the sharks swim by, but it is really amazing to see what God has created under the water. I love scuba diving. And part of that love for scuba diving then uh, goes over into my home. I have a saltwater aquarium that I have saltwater fish and I have corals from the ocean uh, in this tank. And so I, when, I, when I'm not diving, I'd love to be able to sit in my house. And, and it's, so, it's all soothing uh, to be able to see uh, these fish and these corals. It's just very calming. But it's, it's fun to be able to see what I can see in the ocean, see a little microcosm of it in my home. Now, some of the fish that I have in my aquarium are the same fish that are in the ocean. But 
for the most part, the fish in there's there's one major difference between what's in my aquarium and what's in the ocean. And I'm sure you know what that difference is. And typically it's the size. The fish in my aquarium, they may be the same kind, but because they're in that aquarium, they're smaller. They don't get as big as the fish in the ocean. Uh, because of the environment that the fish in the ocean are at in, the foods that they eat, uh, they are able they are able to grow bigger uh, than the ones in my aquarium. This is a lot like leaders, fish and leaders. Fish, are they, their growth is dependent upon their environment and what they eat. Well, as leaders, our growth is also impacted by our environment. It's impacted by what we take in, what we learn, what we read, what we listen to. That impacts how we grow um, as leaders. Personal growth is vital to our leadership. If we're not growing, we're going to have a hard time uh, leading others. And so growing is so crucial. And to, we're going to spend the next couple of days talking about how are ways that we can grow individually, as people, as well as leaders. Every day we have an opportunity to, to grow. And, uh, and so hopefully at the end of this, you'll, have, you'll see how that is possible in your own life. Um, a leader named Benjamin Franklin, he said, one today is worth two tomorrows. With what I am to be, I am now becoming. That's really pretty powerful. We, many of us, we have dreams about what we want to do, what we want to be. But the, 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 the key is, is if you, want to be, if you want to change, that change starts now. What you want to become in a year or five years from now, it's starting now. The decisions that you're making, the things that you're doing now, that's going to determine what you become in the days to come. Uh, here's another quote by a man named Oscar Wilde. He said, I forgot that every little action of the common day makes or breaks my character. Every little thing that I do, decision that I make, it's going to either build me up or tear me down. It's going to help me grow or it's going to keep me from growing. Dr. John Maxwell was in one of his workshops was telling about a, a, a gentleman that he met after one of his workshops. This man, this man came up to him and told him that he was 94 years old. And he said, this last month, I read five books that will help me grow because as long as I'm alive, I want to be growing. Isn't that a great attitude? As long as I'm alive, I want to be growing. Um, and that needs to be our, um, our perspective, our commitment as well. Let's look at the key principle for this lesson. And really, I think for this whole, the whole training, successful people make right decisions early in life and they manage those decisions daily. Successful people make right decisions early in life and they manage those decisions daily. Those two are, are both parts of that statement are, are very crucial. You can make great decisions, but if you don't manage them daily, then you're not going to accomplish what you want to accomplish and vice versa. You can, if you don't make good decisions, even if you're managing, if you're making, doing good things, it's not going to, it's not going to come out well for you. Without a plan for your personal growth, you will be reacting to life instead of living on purpose. You'll be forced to make repairs on your life because it will fall, fall short of your potential. And so here's the question. Do you want to invest your time in preparing or spend your time repairing. It's really a, a matter of being proactive or reactive. Being proactive means you're preventing problems. You're taking steps to, to keep thing, problems from happening. Being reactive is that you're simply taking, you're fixing problems after they happen. Uh, if you've been to all of these workshops, uh, you, maybe you remember a story that I told about a, a village, a community that lived up on, in these mountains in, by this cliff. And they, they had a problem because, you know, the, the children would be out playing beside, you know, they'd get closer and closer to the edge of the cliff. And sometimes they would fall off and then they would fall down and they would get injured and sometimes very badly. And so all the leaders got together and said, what can we do about this? We need to do something because of all of, of our children of, of getting hurt. What do we need to do? And they put their heads together and they started thinking about different ideas and, and finally come up with a solution. And this is what, the, what we'll do, they said. We'll build a hospital at the bottom of the cliff. So that when kids fall off the cliff, then they're really close to the hospital. We can take them real, really fast to the hospital. What do you think about that solution? 
Well, you're thinking, well, that's kind of crazy. Why would you, why would you do that? Why would you just build a, a fence or a wall in front of the cliff to keep kids from falling off? You could prevent the problem from happening uh, to begin with. Well, that's true. But see, that sometimes is the same way that we run our ministries or our personal lives. We tend to be reactive rather than proactive. Instead of building walls and fences and, 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 and preventing things from happening, we wait until there's a problem and then we do something about it. In our churches, when people start having marital problems, we, we get all concerned and we start praying for them and maybe we'll have counseling for them. Well, maybe we shouldn't wait that long. Maybe before they start having problems, maybe we should have marriage enrichment. Maybe we should have training. Maybe we could work harder on, on developing strong marriages so we don't have to worry about them getting, having problems and getting divorces. Uh, for for um, our children, uh, we, we want our children to turn out good, to love the Lord, to, to have good relationships. But sometimes we wait until they get in trouble before we start taking, before we start being proactive. Uh, my kids, before they were even born, I was praying for them that they would know Jesus, that they would, I was praying for their future spouses. I remember when my kids were little and I'd be praying for their future husbands or wives. And my kids would look at me and say, daddy, we're just kids. Why are you praying for a husband or wife? I'm not waiting until I get a phone call saying, dad, we're struggling. I'm praying for them from day one, helping them. I'm preparing. What about our relationships? What about our spiritual growth? Don't, we need to spend more time preparing and and being and and taking the initiative rather than being uh, being reactive. Your book has a, a chart here that that um, compares contrasts uh, preparing versus repairing. In preparing, this allows us to focus on today and tomorrow. What are we going to do? What is the future hold for us? What can we do? But repairing, we spend most of our time looking at back at yesterday, trying to fix the problems from yesterday, put out the fires from yesterday. We don't we don't have the time to be able to look ahead for preparing. It helps increase, it increases our efficiency because we're able to be, we're not just spending our time making fixes just like we would for um, repairing. It increases our confidence. When we're preparing, we're ready for whatever happens. We've prepared whatever, but for repairing, uh, it breeds discouragement. It seems like we're taking one step forward, two steps back, trying to deal with, with the problems. Uh, focusing on preparing, it helps, it, it saves money. Uh, for repairing, it increases costs. It's kind of like the old car repair versus regular maintenance. If you don't maintain your car, then it's going to break down one day and it's going to be a huge problem. There's an old saying that many of us grew up hearing, a stitch in time saves nine. Uh, you take care of things at the beginning. If you don't, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. That's what we're talking about here, preparing versus repairing. For preparing, you're paying now for what's going to happen tomorrow. But for repairing, you're paying now for what was yesterday. How discouraging it is to spend your effort and your time and your energy paying basically for what happened in the past. And then lastly, preparing, it takes you to a higher growth level. Uh, and repairing, it, it really becomes an obstacle for growth because you're spending so much time and effort dealing with problems. Now let's look at um, decisions and discipline. Uh, we're all very familiar with decisions. We make decisions every day. And we're familiar with discipline. It's, it's, it's um, self-control. It's, it's, it's leading yourself to do what needs to be done. And so let's look at some different, um, some different combinations here. If you make good decisions, you make good plans, you, you know what you want to do, you want to see something good happen, if you make good decisions and plans, but you don't have daily discipline, if you're not doing what you have, if you're not carrying out that plan, it, it, your, the result is a plan without a payoff. It results in a lot of work, but really no progress. For example, let's say you wanted to lose some weight and you made a plan. Uh, maybe you even bought a gym membership. You had all these great ideas that what you're going to do to lose weight, but when it time, it's time to get out of bed to go to the gym to go exercise and it's a turn off the alarm clock and just keep sleeping, you're never going to make any progress. You're going to, you have a great plan, you have great dreams, but without actually carrying out with that, you're never going to get anywhere. Let's say you want to grow spiritually, but you're not willing, but you don't get up to early before everything and do your devotions and read your Bible and to pray. You have a great plan, but without the work, without the discipline, you end up with nothing. 
Uh, the next combination is daily discipline. That's doing the right thing without good decisions equals a regiment or work without a reward. Uh, let's say, yes, you're, you want to lose weight. And so you start exercising. You get up early, you start walking, you start running, you start doing whatever. You're starting to exercise. And that's great that you're, you're doing, you're having your daily discipline. But the problem is if you don't follow that up with good decisions, you're not going to make any progress. And so even though you're doing the exercise, if you're making the bad decisions on what you're going to eat, then all the work you did is for nothing. You want to grow spiritually. So you get up early. You spend time in the Bible. You spend time in prayer. You're, you're with people who help you and help you grow spiritually. But then after that, then you go home or in the evening and you fill your mind with things from TV or from the internet, things that, are, that will pull you away from God. Well, then you're going to end up back to where you started. Daily discipline without good decisions equals work without a reward. And then finally, good decisions combined with daily discipline equals a masterpiece of potential. When we're making, when we're setting a good plan, when we have, when we know where we're going to go and we have the, the daily discipline to do that, and we make good decisions, we're able to be successful uh, and to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. Well, I want you to think back again. Remember what our key principle was? The key principle, successful people make right decisions and manage them daily. Successful people make right decisions and they manage them daily. And so now we're going to look at 12 important decisions that we need to make and manage for personal growth. Every day, this is a decision that we need to reaffirm and carry through with it. Good decisions and good discipline that will help us to continue to grow, be the men and women and leaders that God wants us to be. So let's, there's 12 different ones. Let's take a look at these 12 different ones. Number one is attitude. Attitude, choose to display the right attitudes daily. And then the leadership truth is today's attitude gives me possibilities. Our attitudes are so crucial to who we are and what we're able to accomplish and the growth that we're able to have and the impact that we're able to have with people. Some truths about this, my attitude as I begin a task affects its outcome more than anything else. If you go into a, a task or a relationship or, or uh, an event or something with the attitude of, this is never going to work. I can't do this. I'm going to fail. Well, you probably will fail. It probably will be terrible. But if you go in with the right attitude of, yes, I can do this. I'm doing this because God's leading me to do this. God's going to empower me. He's going to help me. This is going to be great. If you go in with this positive attitude, you're more, much more likely to be successful in that. B. My attitude towards others often determines their attitude towards me. Now, we're all familiar with this. The way that we treat other people, it tends to be the way that they will treat us back. The way that we respond to them often influences very heavily on how they're going to respond to us. We have to realize that if we want a good attitude from other people, well, they need to be getting that from us. C, my attitude, not my achievements, gives me happiness. My attitude, not my achievements, give me happiness. Oh, we like to be successful. We like to win. And when we are successful and we're win, when we do well, well, that brings us joy. But that's really short-lived joy. It will only bring us happiness for a short time. And then we're looking for the next thing to bring us happiness. My attitude, not my achievement, gives me happiness. D, my attitude, whether it's good or bad, it's contagious. The attitude that we have, it's going to rub off on people. Um, our good attitude or our bad attitude, it's going to be contagious. It's going to rub, rub off on people. The earlier you make a decision about possessing a good attitude, the greater the compounding effect on your life and leadership. Remember, your attitude is a choice that you make. Nobody can force you to have a good attitude or a bad attitude. No matter what somebody does to you, it's your choice on how you're going to respond. Somebody cuts you off on traffic. Somebody, somebody uh, cuts in front of you in line at the grocery store. Somebody says something rude to you. Your response is your choice. They're not forcing you to have a bad attitude. It's your choice on how you respond. I know that it's hard, but it is your choice. 
our attitude is so crucial. I love this little cartoon. Never give up. Here's this frog being eaten by the stork, but he's hanging on to the, to the stork's throat, not letting him swallow him. No matter how, things, how bad things look, he's not going to give up. And that needs to be our attitude, a positive attitude that no matter what it looks like, no matter how bad things are, I'm going to make it, make it through this. We're going to be okay. At the end of this little section here, you have personal assessment questions, and we're not going to spend time discussing them, uh, but I hope that you'll think about them, go back after the, the lessons are over and, and spend some time looking at these. And the first question is, where is it most difficult for you to keep a positive attitude? Um, is it uh, in, in, when you're planning something, when you're out with people, when, it's, when you're starting a project, where is, the most, when is it most difficult for you to keep a positive attitude? And, and the second one is, what is one step you can take to improve your attitude? What are some things that you can do to call attention to your attitude, to change your attitude, and to have a positive attitude? So the first important decision that we must have, the first important decision we must manage and make and manage every day is, to choose to display the right attitude daily. Okay, next one. Number two is priorities. Priorities, determine and act upon important priorities daily. And the leadership truth there is today's priorities give me focus. Today's priorities give me focus. We need to understand God's purpose and God's mission for our lives that will help us to determine and to set what our priorities are. And once we know that, then it becomes much easier to set those priorities and to make decisions based on those priorities. Some truths about this, time is our most precious commodity. You can't ever get more time. Uh, you can't earn more time. It's so important. B, we cannot manage time. We only manage opportunities. We only have enough time for a certain number of opportunities. We can either respond to those, take advantage of those, or ignore those. C, we cannot change time, only our priorities. And then D, priorities help us choose wisely. We don't have enough time to do everything. And so priorities help us decide what's most important. Because isn't it a tragedy when we spend the limited amount of time on things that are not important? And the things that are important, the things that should have, be top priorities in our lives, we don't have enough time to do what we need to do with them. Your time is priceless. You cannot get more time. And so it's important to understand these, these key principles. Now, this next statement has impacted my life tremendously as I, um, as I lead and as I make decisions. Every time you say yes to something, you must say no to something else. You can't do more than one thing at a time. You, have to, you can't be in two different places at a time. You, you only have a certain amount of time and energy and resources. And so whatever you say yes to, on the other hand, you're also having to say no to other things. Priorities help us understand and decide if what we're saying no to is more important than the things we are saying yes to or vice versa. We want to say yes to the things that are most important, that are our high priorities. Remember, every time you say yes to something, you must say no to something else. Make sure you choose, you say yes to what's most important to your mission, to what God has for you, for your relationships. The personal assessment questions here, what are your top three to five most important priorities? What are the priorities that God has given to you? Obviously, your priorities of your relationship with God should be at the very top. What are the rest of your priorities? I hope you also have family, your health, ministry, vocation, etc. So what are your top three to five most important priorities? And then do you stick to them? Do your priorities really inform uh, your actions and the things that you do? Do you really do the things you do based on your priorities? Number three, health. Know and follow healthy guidelines daily. And the leadership truth, today's health gives me strength. Letter A, lasting leaders recognize their body is the vehicle that carries them to their mission. God has given you and I a mission. He's given you and I a purpose. He's given us opportunities to lead people and ministries and make an impact for the kingdom of God. He wants us to accomplish things in his kingdom. But if we are sick, 
if we die early, how are we going to accomplish those, that mission that he's given to us? This body is our vehicle to be able to accomplish the missions that he's given to us. And so we need to take care of this if we're going to accomplish what God has for us. You and I, we need good health. Um, I read something the other day that, that kind of struck me. Uh, it first kind of made me laugh, but then it made me kind of grimace a little bit. It says, the fork has killed more people than guns. The fork kills more people than guns. The way that we eat, the things that we eat, gives it, brings, brings along bad health and, and, and premature death. We need to recognize that our body is important. We need to take care of it. B, proper diet and exercise provide the energy to lead well over the long haul. If we want to be able to, like I mentioned earlier, if we want to be able to accomplish what we want to accomplish, we need to eat right. <coughs> we need to exercise. I'm not saying you have to go out and run five miles every day, but we need to walk. We need to be healthy so that we can, we do have the energy. We can go out and we have the health and we can go and help and serve and minister. And then see your physical health will impact your spiritual stamina and perspective. Have you ever thought about this? It's very true. Our physical health has an impact on our spiritual life. Let's look at the example of Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit took him to the desert to prepare him for ministry, you remember that, that Satan appears and he tempts him uh, in, in three different ways, three different temptations. When did Satan come to tempt Jesus? Now, Jesus was, in the, had, was going to be in the desert for 40 days. Did Satan come on day one or day two when, Satan, when, when Jesus was still strong? No, he waited for 40 days when Jesus had been fasting. For 40 days, his body was weak. He was tired. And that's when Satan attacked. That's the same thing that happens to us. When we get run down, when we're tired, when, when we're not healthy, that affects us spiritually. And that's when Satan attacks us. We need to be healthy physically. And that will also help us to be uh, healthy spiritually. Again, here we tend to do more repairing than preparing. Let's take care of ourselves and not wait until the heart attack. Wait until the bad health before we start taking care of ourselves. Personal assessment, rate your diet, your exercise, and your rest. And that's nothing I didn't really mention about rest. We need to sleep enough. Make sure you have enough energy for the day. Are you healthy? What changes do you need to make? Number four, family. Communicate with and care for my family daily. And today in leadership, in leadership truth is today's family gives me stability. Isn't that a great statement? Our family gives us stability. Let's look at some truths here. A, families are often lost, spent as the price for successful ministry. I know you've heard this because I've heard this too. Well-meaning people, even well-meaning leaders have told me, don't worry about your family. God will take care of your family. You're in charge of ministry. You're a, you're a missionary. You're a pastor. You're a leader. You need to focus on ministry. That's a lie. That is a lie. We need to take care of our family as our first part of ministry before we take care of others in ministry. We need to take care of our family. B. If we cannot lead our home, if we cannot lead our homes, we cannot expect to lead the church. And we read about this in 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5, as uh, the Apostle Paul is giving Timothy um, advice about qualifications as leaders. Students, he also invited our Okay, whoever has their mic on, could you mute your mic, please? Thank you. C, success is having those who are closest to me love and respect me the most. You know, so many times we spend so much energy on trying to impress people, impress leaders, impress people at our work and our community. We're spending so much time trying to impress them that those who are closest to us, our family, they don't, they don't get the best us. We neglect them. Real success is not having the biggest church. Real success is starting with having a family who 
loves you and loves the Lord, and then go on to these other things. D. Families are like gardens. They must be cultivated and watered regularly. Our families, just like we take care of a garden and we water and take care of it, our families, we need to take care of them. We need to spend good time with them, not just quality time, but they need quantity time as well. Let's make sure that our families realize that we, that they're our, our priority and that we help them to grow. Now, values that foster healthy family relationships include the following. A commitment to God. If we want our family to grow and be healthy, we need to, as a family, have this commitment to God that we're going to follow him, we're going to serve him, uh, that we're going to love him. And that's going to be seen in, in how we lead our families and the things that we do together as a family. A second value is continued growth. We're going to grow. We want our, each of our family members to grow as individuals, but also to grow together as a family. Uh, three, common experiences. We want to do things together. We want to make memories together. It's impossible to have a, a close, healthy family if we don't do things together and um, have those memories together. Four, confidence each in each other and in the Lord. We need to um, have realize that we are there for one another. When things get hard, we're going to be there to support each other. And that we're going to have confidence in the Lord. We're, we've seen him work in our lives and we can trust him as we make decisions as a family. Maybe it's going to be scary. Maybe it's going to be hard. Maybe it's going to it's going to cost us sacrifices, but because of our confidence in the Lord and each other, we're willing to make those. And then five, making a contribution to life together, serve together, minister together, uh, making an impact on the world together. These things will help us to foster healthy family relationships and healthy families. As leaders, well, even, even with these things, balancing work and family life is a challenge. And as leaders, we must Put our family on the calendar first. So many times we fill up our calendars with, with work and with ministry, with church activities, and then whatever's left is what our family gets. They just get the leftovers, and that's not right. Let's make sure that they have some of our best energy, some of our best time, um, the best of us. Find ways to spend time together. I know we have we live in, in busy societies, we have lots of things, there's lots of responsibilities but find ways to spend time together. When my children were home, we worked so hard, even though our kids had sports and different activities and then jobs, and we always worked to try to have one meal together per day. That wasn't always possible, but for the most part, it was. A meal together where we could just eat together, catch up with what was going on in each other's lives and support each other and pray together and look at God's word together. Uh, find time to... Uh, I said I've been married for 36 years. That's amazing that I've been with Bethany for that long. What a great relationship we have. Before we were married, I did all I could to, to win her over. I, we went on dates and I gave her gifts and I said nice things to her. But, and, but for some guys, once that marriage happens and they think, well, I, I can stop that. I've got her. Well, no, we need to keep wooing our wives our husbands. We need to keep building on our relationship. My wife and I, we've been married for 36 years, but we still go on dates. Every two weeks, we go out together. When our kids were home, we'd find somebody to take care of the kids, something. We would still go out, just the two of us, just to be together, to talk together, and grow closer together. I would go out with, on, quote, dates with my kids, one-on-one. -on -one. So that I'd be with my daughter, with my son. We'd go out and do things that they like to do together, to build our relationship, to talk, to study God's Bible together. We'd spend time together. So find ways to get to be together. Appreciate, express appreciation for each other. Don't take each other for granted. Thanks for doing, for cooking this meal. Thanks for taking out the garbage. Thanks for making your bed. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for that. Thanks for providing for our family. Express appreciation for each other. Be honest and resolve conflict as quickly as possible. In every family, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be disagreement, but how do you respond to disagreement and conflict? Well, we need to respond to it quickly and with grace. And our kids need to see how conflict is handled well because they will have to handle conflict when they get out in that world and at school and at their jobs. They need to see us um, showing them as examples of what it means to, to uh, resolve conflict uh, in, in a healthy way. All of these things, 
will help us to build stronger family relationships. We need to work hard at that. Okay, so for our personal assessment, how do you demonstrate that your family is a top priority? Think about that. Number five, thinking. Practice and developing good thinking daily. Today's, tr uh, today's thinking gives me an advantage. Some truths that your Bible lists here, or your Bible, your book, a major difference between successful and unsuccessful people is how they think. Hmm. God is the original source of creative ideas, and he has made us in his image. Thus, we were created with the ability to think, to be creative. All that a person achieves or fails to achieve is the direct result of their thoughts. Thoughts about themselves, about their abilities, about God, about God's abilities. Thinking, all that a person achieves or fails to achieve is the direct result of their thoughts. So that's interesting to think about. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is hard for me because thinking takes time. And I, and I have all these things to do, ministries to take care of, people to contact. I have all these things. and I don't have time to just sit and think. And so it's hard for me to take the time to sit and think. But it's really important that we do. Most of us do far too little thinking. Your book lists a bunch of different kinds of thinking, but thinking skills of effective people, different ways of, of thinking. And, and I think it's, it's so interesting looking through these and, and some of them we do on a regular basis, but others we don't hardly ever do. And it might be a good idea to start using some of these ways of thinking. Uh, the first one is big picture thinking, the ability to think beyond yourself and your world. You know, it's more than just your church or your life or your ministry. There's a whole world out there. There's lots of other churches and ministries and people out there. How do we fit into this? How, what's going on? How can that help us? How can we help them? Focus thinking. The ability to think with clarity by removing distractions or clutter. You know, we are surrounded by distractions. It's very rarely, it seems like, are we ever quiet? We have the radio on, the TV on, our computer on. We are surrounded by people. It's hard to get focused sometimes with all of these distractions around us. Creative thinking, the ability to break out of your box and explore new ideas. Uh, we need to use creative thinking to get out of ruts that we get into. And many of our churches, we do a lot of things just because we've always done that. It's always been that way. We've always done it that way. We need to read. We need to listen to people that maybe we don't agree with, that do things differently. And by listening and thinking about that, Maybe that will jog new ideas and help you to be creative in, in how we can be more effective in our mission. Realistic thinking. That's the ability to build on a sol solid foundation of facts and reality. Yes, there are facts. There is a reality of what our communities are like, what the needs are here. What do we need to do about the facts? Strategic thinking. The ability to implement plans that increase potential for tomorrow. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? What do we need to be able to do that? We need to spend time in strategic thinking on how we're going to accomplish God's mission for us personally and as a church or as a ministry. There's possibility thinking, the ability to unleash enthusiasm or hope to solve the impossible, to dream big dreams. If I could do anything, what would I do? As a church, if, we, if there was no limitations to to, for, for resources or personnel, or whatever, what would we try to do? What are, it's dreaming big. It's, it's thinking about the possibilities. There's reflective thinking, the ability to revisit the past and gain perspective. What has happened in the past? Where have we come from? How has God led us in the past to where we are today? Uh, if we don't look at the past and we don't learn from the past, they, it's very well known that if you don't know the past, you're often going to repeat the mistakes of the past. Reflective thinking. Questioning popular thinking. It's the ability to reject the common thinking, to gain new ideas. You know, sometimes these days, you know, the, the, we hear the latest ways of doing things, the, the, the popular fad, doing this or doing that. And, and we think, oh, well, if it's good for them, maybe it'll be good for us. If they're having successful success in their church with that, maybe we should try that. Well, let's think critically about these things before we just grab them and take them. Let's think about, is this going to work for us? Is this what God wants for us at this time? 
shared thinking, the ability to include others to go beyond your own thoughts. It's amazing what we can do collectively that we can't do individually. How can we combine our resources of, of, of thought, of planning, of, of resources? We're stronger together. How can we work together? Shared thinking, unselfish thinking, the ability to consider others and to think with collaboration. Again, how can we work together? Bottom line thinking, ability to focus on results and reap the best rewards. What are we doing that's having the most success, the most, uh, the, the best results? Um, thinking through these different things will help us to be more effective. Now for our personal assessment questions. Do you have a place and a time to simply sit and think? John Maxwell talks about in his office, he has what he calls the thinking chair. And it's a chair that's in his office to the side. And the only time he ever sits in that is when he thinks. It, it reminds him of spending time thinking about what he's doing, where he needs to go, where he needs to, what, what has been happening. Do you have a place and a time to simply sit and think? Where and when do you do your best thinking? Let's look at number six now, commitment. Make and keep proper commitments daily. Make and keep proper commitments daily. Leadership truth, today's commitment gives me tenacity. What's tenacity? Tenacity is being able to hang on strong, to be able to overcome obstacles that come your way. Why is commitment important? It matters today because commitment can change your life. Most life changes are connected to decisions. You make a decision, if you keep the commitment, if you commit to that and keep it, you're able to make big changes. You're able to accomplish great things. But without commitment, it doesn't happen. Commitment is important because it helps you overcome many of life's obstacles. We all are going to face obstacles, regardless of what we're trying to accomplish. To accomplish God's mission, to accomplish what he wants for our life, we're going to have obstacles. And commitment will help us to get around it, over it, under it, through it. It helps us get over the obstacles. And see, every day your commitment will be tested. When you have to wake up early to go exercise, when you have to give extra time uh, to be able to spend time in your, in your Bible, reading and, and praying, when you have to make a sacrifice of energy and time doing something rather than what you might want to do, it's gonna, you're going to be tested on whether you want to keep that commitment or not. Here's a quote from Ken Blanchard. When you're interested in something, simply interested in something, you do it only when it's convenient when you feel like it, when you're committed to something, you accept no excuses, only results. Commitment. Your commitment matters in our personal life, and commitment also matters um, in that broken commitments destroy your influence with others. Commitments make a big impact on you personally as well as on those that you lead. Personal assessment. What are the top three commitments of your life, and how could you deepen your commitment in those areas? Number seven, finances. Make and properly manage money daily. Leadership truth. Today's finances give me options. Uh, some important truths about finances. Money won't make you happy. Now, I know most of us say, I'd sure like to try that. Give it a try. But in the long run, money will not make us happy. There's many, of, many examples of that. B, debt will make you unhappy. Um, when we are in debt, it's like we are in slavery to somebody uh, to pay them back. Uh, we must really learn to live within our means and take it easy on the credit cards. C, having financial margins gives you options. That means financial flexibility. Having a budget is so important for us. But some of us, we have our budget down to the very penny. Every, every penny is, is designated for something, and we have no wiggle room. And so when, we have, when there's a special need, we have nothing to give. When there's a special offering taken at church, we have no money to give. When somebody has a special need, we have nothing to give. We need to make sure that we have some wiggle room in there that we're able to give when the need arises. Uh, again, back to our budget. We have, when we do our budgets, we have money for uh, the necessities, for our rent or our house payment, for electricity, for the things that we have to have, for tithes, for savings. And then we have money set aside for ourselves just to do things that are fun for us, to buy clothes, to buy new things. Well, what happens when you get a raise? Well, for most of us, we increase that personal money. Now I have more money to spend. 
rather than setting aside some money for something else. We don't have to spend everything that we earn. Um, I love this quote by uh, John Wesley. And I'm sure that you've heard it before in the, in the past as well. He said, you should earn all you can. And then from all that you earn, you need to save all, of you, all that you can. He doesn't want us to earn all we can because we are, need to be greedy. He says, no, earn all you can, save all you can, and then give all you can. We are called to be generous people. Uh, let's, have, let's set aside money that we can be generous to others. Uh, personal assessment, how does your spending reveal what's in your heart and what changes should you make and where your money goes? Number eight, faith. Deepen and live out my faith deep, uh, daily. Today's faith gives me peace. Today's faith gives me peace. Faith gives me divine perspective today. My faith in the Lord, it helps me see things through Jesus' eyes. It helps me to see people through the eyes of God. It helps with his priorities. My faith helps me to see situations or problems, obstacles in a different way because I, can, I have a divine perspective. My faith gives me strength for today, knowing that I don't live today on my own, that my faith in God, he will enable me. He will help me. He will... Um, he walks along with me, and my faith gives me resilience today. I can keep going no matter how hard. God's grace and his strength, it sustains me. Where there is, I like this quote, where there is no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. Our faith gives us power for today and in the future. Faith enables us to take risks for God. We will either live in faith or fear. My prayer for us is that we will live in faith. Our personal assessment questions as a leader, do you model strong faith and how can I grow in my faith? Let's look at number nine, relationships. We need to initiate and invest in solid relationships daily. Today's relationships give me fulfillment. It's amazing how these are true, that you will enjoy life more if you enjoy people. Doing things together is so much more enjoyable than just doing them by ourselves. People increase the joy, increase the happiness, doing things together. You'll get further in life if people enjoy you. People, when people enjoy you, like being around you, they'll also help you in your journey to get further, to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in and through you. And see, most people can trace their successes and failures to the relationships in their life, whether those were good relationships or bad relationships. Relationships are so crucial. Um, to what we want to accomplish. Leadership, it's about relationships. And if we're going to lead people, we need to be able to connect with people. And isn't that what Christianity is all about? It's about relationships. This vertical relationship, this horizontal relationship, we have to focus on relationships and strengthen those relationships. Uh, let's look at our personal reflection questions. Do I experience healthy, close relationships? Or do I isolate myself and withdraw from them as a leader? Number 10, generosity. Plan for and model generosity daily. Today's generosity gives me significance. Giving turns, giving turns your focus outward. If we're given to others, we realize that it's not all about me, that my finances, my resources are not just for me. Giving adds values to others. When we give, whether it's our time, our resources, our knowledge, we are helping others. They benefit. And giving helps the giver because when we give, it's just a natural that we're going to receive back. King Solomon says it this way. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. Personal assessment. Do others see me as a generous person? How can I increase my generosity? We need to remember that we are in the world to enrich it, to bless it, to advance God's kingdom. We can't lose sight of that. Let's be generous people. Uh, number 11, values. Embrace and practice good values daily. Today's values give me direction. Every individual, church, organization need to identify their personal core values that they will live by. Core values are the principles that guide the major decisions that we make. They are the power behind those decisions as well. 
methods, there are many methods, but few values. Methods, they always change, but values, they don't. My values function as an anchor, holding me fast to what I believe in and know to be true. They keep me where I need to be. They help me to, to keep uh, within the boundaries that God sets for us. Our values, they function as a faithful friend, keeping me true to myself and to my God. They remind me of, of what is important and what's not, what's right and what's wrong, what's holy and what's not. They keep me going where I need to go. Just a moment, please. My values function as a North Star, guiding the decisions of my life and keeping me on mission. And let's look at the personal assessment. What are your personal core values? What are your family's core values, your churches? Just a moment. I was getting a message that my computer was was unplugged and just wanted to make sure that it was plugged and so we're ready to go. Okay, so personal assessment. Number 12, growth. Seek and experience improvements daily. Seek and experience improvements daily. And today it, today's growth gives me potential. You and I were created with great potential. God has a great mission for each one of us. If we, we need to seek and experience improvements daily in order to accomplish that. I read this quote. It's really kind of sad. Hell begins on that day when God reveals all that we might have achieved, all the gifts that we wasted, and all that we might have done that we did not do. Isn't that going to be terrible? To, to find out, Wouldn't that be terrible to find out that God had all these great, incredible plans for you. But because of our decisions, because of our lack of discipline, because of our lack of commitment, for whatever reason, we didn't accomplish what he created us to accomplish. That would truly be tragic. There are some uh, misconceptions about personal growth. One of those first misconceptions is that growth is automatic. No, that's not true. Just because you you go through life doesn't mean that you're going to um, grow. Just because you get older does not mean that, that you're going to grow. We must deliberately pursue growth if we're going to grow. It's not automatic. B, another misconception is that growth comes with experience. Oh, you can have lots of experiences, but if you're not learning from those experiences, you're not going to grow. That's, that's false. And then C, growth comes from information. That's also a misconception. And there are a lot of really smart people I have a lot of information but they're not mature they're not wise they're not doing the right thing knowledge doesn't guarantee growth the greatest gap in life is the one between knowing and doing many people know the right thing to do but they're not doing it they know what they need to do to grow but they're not doing it it's important to not only know but also to do you remember what our key principle when we started this lesson was? Remember? Successful people make right decisions and they manage those decisions daily. Every day, once again, we have to confirm that our commitment to that decision and manage, make good decisions based on that commitment. Let's look through these um, 12 again really quickly. Add it to every day. We need to manage and, and and, and man, we need to make the decision and manage personal growth attitude, our priorities, our health, our family, thoughts, commitments, our finances, our faith, our relationships, our generosity, our values, 